see me that well today it's just because we're recording a little bit earlier than usual and I don't have blinds on these windows behind me so just deal with it everyone it'll be okay um, but the important thing is we're here to talk about a great episode but first let's talk about what, what you got in your pipe today Ben uh, tonight I have the English Lux from the tobacconist down in St. Paul that mm -hmm. you've been going to so I thought I'd try this one out this week and it's actually pretty it's not it's not like the uh, the other Englishes that I've had. I don't know. Oh, there goes Sam the dog. Oh, but getting go. a cameo Thanks. here. <laughs> yeah, Sam, way to go. Uh, I don't know. It's a little less, I don't know, bitter, maybe, yeah. than most. So it, I like it. It's good. What and, do you have tonight? Yep, I've got uh, something from the same tobacconist blend called Shipwrecked. And this pipe I just got in the mail this afternoon. It's a Ben Wade Prevenholm car pipe. Uh, ben Wade pipes are kind of they're kind of a major manufacturer, so I don't necessarily go for them. But Previn Holm was a carver who worked for them. He's passed away now, uh, but worked for them, you know, in the 80s and 90s, and just does incredible pipes. I have three Previn Holm pipes, uh, so this is my third, and uh, that's why I bought it because I found it at just a steal mm -hmm. on eBay. It's like okay, if I can get a Previn Holm pipe for 50 bucks. That's just a no-brainer. i got to snatch it up. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, thoroughly enjoying this. Kind of a long pipe. Not quite a church warden, but definitely longer than your standard briar. And uh, now we have, you know, what is this? Uh, this is a up-and-coming brewer, at least in Minnesota terms. I don't know where they're based out of. Massachusetts, I believe. Oh, there you go. So they haven't quite made it all the way over to the Midwest really yet. They're just starting to make their thing here. Uh, it's a... Uh, company called Clown Shoes, and then the one that we're having tonight is called Space Cake. Okay. Uh, and the art on it is amazing, I'm yeah. saying. The art on it is really cool. Uh, but it is also 9%, I think. Nice. And so we're going to drink double this. IPA. We're going to drink this nice and slow this afternoon. Hey, your perfect afternoon beer. Um, not as much flavor as, it, as I was expecting. I don't know. I was expecting more flavor. I was definitely expecting more hops than this has. See, you're, now that you're becoming more of an IPA fan, you're getting so immune to hops. And it's like 100 IBUs does nothing for you anymore. Well, the... I don't know. I had the Hoppy Feet this weekend from the same company. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. But this yeah. is... I don't know. I can get used to this. I can have this. Yeah. They actually have this at the curling rink, so... Oh, nice. man, I gotta come watch you curl. You gotta, clearly, that is the thing to do. So <laughs> and by watch you curl, I mean get drunk while you actually do something <laughs> athletic. We drink while we curl. I'm and just, get drunk. <laughs> I'm just saying, we can be at the same level when we get back to the restaurant. Nice. Yeah, I, I love clown shoes. I've had a number... I haven't had this one, but I've had a number of their beers, and... Uh, they are quite quite a solid brewery, so check yeah. them out if you get a chance. For sure. All right, so this episode eight, the mountain and the biker, which is what I know we all want to talk about, because what a scene to end this week. Jeez, criminy. Holy guacamole. Uh, I'm surprised we can actually keep anything down after that scene, but we'll get there. We'll get there. We got a lot of stuff to get to first. Starting up north at the wall. Uh, where, hey, those Thens and Egret are back. They're invading Molestown, everyone. Um, I felt this whole storyline with Egret and the Thens is just so drawn out that it's just killing me. Oh, they've been spinning their wheels like crazy. I mean, they're just like, I don't know, they're running out of crap. You know, and it, it's kind of hurting them because I, from what I've heard, and this might turn out to not be true, but from what I've heard, Next week is going to take place entirely at the wall, like what they did with Black Water in season two. Uh, and even though I know what's going to happen, and let me just say that even if you haven't enjoyed the wall storyline this year, there's really good stuff coming next week. 
but they botched this storyline so much at this point that it's hard to feel that excited. I'm so over it. Yeah. I'm just bored. Even though the, you know there's great stuff coming, and it's like, okay, we have the thing in Molestown, which is essentially just the Fens are doing bad stuff some more, and Egret's not as bad as them. I, and then we have a conversation at Castle Black. I get that they chose to go with Egret's storyline because we know it already. Right. But I would be, and if they're going to make up a storyline, yeah. I would much rather that it would have been north of the wall. Mm-hmm. I would much rather see the King of the North trying to trudge south here because we don't get that in the books. Oh, and yeah. And that would be just a fast, and they would it would be a great story to tell. Well, and they cast, I mean, the actor they cast to play Mance Raider, Syrian Hands, which I don't know if you've ever watched Rome. No. Uh, so he plays Julius Caesar in the first season of Rome. Yeah. And he is incredible. That is such a great show. And they cast him... As Mance Raider, and I was so excited because I loved Rome. Yeah. And we've seen him in one episode so far. So next week we'll probably, assuming he actually shows up, will be his second appearance. And what's really weird is that he was their second choice. They, they offered it to Dominic West, who plays uh, Jimmy McNulty in The Wire. And he turned down the role because he didn't want to spend so much time away from his family. It's like, well, dude, apparently it was a weekend trip over there to film because she did like all of five minutes. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, yeah, I mean, the one funny thing that I did enjoy from this opening scene was uh, the burping of uh, the Bear and the Maiden Fair and uh, Reigns of Castamere. And you said it. I'll let you say it. Yeah, because those are the only two songs that exist in this world. So I thought it was a bit of self-awareness. Well, let's be honest. They probably paid like thousands of dollars for each of those songs. Uh Uh-huh. And so they have to use them as much as possible. And why not use them both at the same time at this point? Right. Yeah, I I felt like it was maybe a bit more self-aware than anything else. That they're like, okay, we know we've just been doing different variations on these two songs all over the place. So, we're just going to have some fun with it. I hope so. I hope that's what happened. And then, uh, in Castle Black, Sam and John are sad. Yeah, they've come to the realization that 102 versus 100,000 is is not good odds. Now, I thought in the book that it was 1,000 to 100,000. Is that right? Yeah, maybe those, uh... I mean, not that it matters. So... I mean, it's like a hundred to one versus ten to one at that, or you know, versus a thousand. Yeah. To one, but <coughs> so, oh, there's why you don't inhale with pipes, everyone. <coughs> so, I really, I don't know. I'm just, I didn't think that that scene was necessary. Yeah, I mean, I, here's how I feel about next week. Let's let's just assume for a moment that they are going to do the whole episode at the wall. Uh, and you and I have read the books, mm-hmm. so I think you would agree with me that the material they'll be covering next week is really, really good. Oh, yeah. The law. Next week, episode nine, as always, is going to be great. But... My expectations are up there. But they haven't earned it in terms of the show storytelling this season, of the storyline of the wall. They haven't earned the right to devote an entire episode to up there. No. You know... They haven't spent the time to create the storyline to make me feel like I want to be up there. If you're not a book reader, you care less. Exactly. It's going to be up there. Yeah. So it is going to be cool. Um, but definitely, uh, for as good as the season has been, and I think it has been a great season, uh, definitely... The Wall storyline has been... The weak link. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Speaking of weak links... After we're up at the wall, and this episode is going to get better, everyone. I mean, there's some really good stuff here, but uh, we go to uh, Marine, and we have a Grey Worm and Miss Sandy romance brewing. Soups, Alex. Like, what the hell? You know what? I'm going to stick up for the show right here. You ready for this? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. In the books, when they get to Marine... um, Danny does start to have problems right. with the Unsullied going after women. And <laughs> hanging out in bars, she does have that problem. See, I don't remember that. She does. Okay. That, that is a problem in the book. Is they go to, like, 
whorehouses and they go to these places and they're on the streets and are being like normal guys in the storylines. But Using so, the Game of Thrones lingo, they don't have the pillar and or stones to do anything. Or the uh, the uh, stem and the root, if you are um, <laughs> uh, fairies. That had to be that the best. Uh, For as much as I didn't like the subplot, I'm so glad we got that conversation. That, I think that's why they have it in there. But I'm going to stick her for the show here, and I think that having... Grey Worm being the only Unsullied that we know, having Grey Worm be the person to express this maybe I'm still a man even though I don't have my manhood thing is the most compelling part of that storyline. Yeah. Even though in the book it might only be three sentences. Okay. That's fair enough. Uh, I'll be honest, part of, <laughs> part of why this scene didn't work for me is that uh, there's a video going around right now, which if you haven't seen it, you should uh, search it out, of Seth Rogen and Snoop Dogg talking about Game of Thrones, and they're extremely high in this video. I've heard about it. And, <laughs> and they have this long conversation in the middle of their uh, of the video about whether or not the Unsullied still have dicks or whether or not it was just the balls that got cut off. And so, we're all wondering it. Uh, and let's be honest, we were all hoping Grey Worm would stand up there so that we could get that question answered once and for all. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, what what Danny was uh, asking Miss Andy about, is it the pillar and the stones? We've all wondered it. And no answers were forthcoming, but... No answers were forthcoming with berries either. No. <laughs> Completely up to mystery. The only thing we are for sure of is that Theon is without. Man, you're getting the segues tonight because next up is Theon. Going to Mount K Mount Kalen. Uh, and it was fun to get to see Mount Kalen. I mean this is that's not quite I mean it's about what I pictured. I pictured it on the literally on the water, but that's fine. I'll mm -hmm. take what I can get. Yeah, so uh night pretty much an impregnable fort in the sense that it's just <laughs> surrounded by a swamp. A swamp yeah. but yeah there's no way to get it. <coughs> Except for the one road, yeah. Yeah. A uh, great performance by Alfie Allen in in the scene as he goes in there as Theon and just starts to lose it. You know, I I was just like, it's been so long since we've seen him so confident, and I've right. forgotten how confident Theon Greyjoy was. And he did a wonderful job. And then you just saw him lose it, and I was just like. I believed it, mm -hmm. like, 100%. He did a wonderful job with that scene, a wonderful job. Yeah, and then later on we get the follow-up scene with Ramsay being made the legitimate heir. It brought a tear to my eye. <laughs> what a touchy father-son Oh, moment. man, you're going to make me your real son? Do you promise to? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is really fascinating to me because the, the parallels and uh, opposites between the Boltons and the Starks are just right there for you to dive into and analyze. Yeah. I mean, you have the ruler with the bastard son uh, who he has a lot of affection for. You have Theon as a prisoner of both the Starks and the Boltons. And it's like they're almost the same except they're completely different uh, in terms of everything else. In terms uh, of morality. In terms of Morality and yeah. Theon never got any parts cut off or whatever, and yeah. Uh, so Ram, uh, so the Boltons thoroughly in control of the North at this point. Yeah. Or the Westeros is Canada, as you might think yes, about it. Yes. Yes. Goes seven hundred miles that way. That's how. Five hundred, and there's ten people who live here. That's how I usually describe it to Emily. Westeros is Canada. Well, I, no, I describe Westeros as North America. And then you go, King's Landing is like Florida, Georgia. And then, like, Dreadford is up in, like, Vermont. Kind of, sort of. Mm -hmm. And then, like, um, Win Winterfell is, like, Winnipeg. Yep. And then... I don't know. I think it's a loyal Minnesotan. Uh, we're Winterfell. You know, Twin City. Duluth. Okay. Yeah, Duluth. Yes. Okay, that's fine. 
And then, yeah. So that's how usually how I describe it to you. Nice, nice. Marines over in uh, Italy. And, yep. Uh, that's about what it is. Pretty much. Uh, okay. So then we go to the Airy. And we have Littlefinger on trial. And, oh man, are they speeding up the whole Sansa's not, you know, so innocent anymore storyline. <laughs> they were laying that on thick this week. You know, I loved in the books, especially in book four, the development of her storyline. Because now they're in book four with mm -hmm. her storyline. Because I believe the last scene of book three was... For yes. falling down the moon. Yes. In fact, that there. outside of the epilogue of book three, which I really hope we get to see in, in uh, episode ten yes. this week. Uh, two weeks. In two weeks, yeah. It, that is the final chapter. Yeah. And that was... I mean, uh, I was ready to read book four. And in book four, they spend chapters on uh, Littlefinger coaching Sansa on... Well, no, you do this instead of this, and this is why you do this instead of this, and he's just like this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I get it. And I feel like, I feel like I could follow along that storyline a little bit too. Like, oh yeah, I get it. No, I feel like I can kind of play the game a little bit. But skipping over that, I just feel like, I don't know. Sansa didn't have it in her. Right. Before those scenes, she would have never. And I felt like in the show here, she wouldn't have had it in her either. But then, I don't know, it, in the show they make it seem like something just clicks and she's like, oh, okay, this is what you want me to be, like a badass? Like, yeah. That's fine. Well, the other part that I, you know, for as much as I do like seeing Sansa go in that direction, because uh, I think it's her natural character development, right. even if they're skipping some steps. So one thing I don't like is that there's no way, and I commented on this a little bit with last week's video, uh, there's no way that Littlefinger goes into that room without all his bases covered. And the biggest base to have covered is Sansa. There's no way he walks into that room without knowing what she's going to say. I am still confused as to why they didn't do it like they did in the book. Where he blames Marillion? Yeah, in the book there's a musician that comes to the wedding and sticks around for a little while, like all good musicians do, because they have absolutely nowhere else to go. And Well, he actually, Marillion came with cattle on Interior the first time. Oh, and just stayed? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyways, he was in, he was in the room when uh, Lysa gets pushed through the moon door. Yeah. And then he gets blamed for the whole thing, and actually... He, Littlefinger talks him into being essentially executed for that, yeah. right? Like, and so... Well, that was my point last week. I don't see... And I, it sounds like you had the same reaction, that Littlefinger doesn't push her out the wit, out the moon door without having somebody to pin it on. Right. It just... It doesn't line up with the Littlefinger. It doesn't... No, it just doesn't make any sense. And he wouldn't have bet all of his cards like he did this week on Sansa telling exactly. the story that she did. Yeah, because in it the just... book, everything plays out in that scene last week like we saw. You know, he kisses her and says, I've only loved one woman. Right, right. Uh, who? Your sister. You know, that's all the same. But then he, there's that additional line of dialogue where guards come in here, the singer just killed my wife. Right, and that's the last line. And so he... Know, he covered his bases, and he, in the show he didn't. And yeah. that is so unlittlefinger like that it drives me a little bit crazy. Yeah, I think and what they did was they sacrificed Littlefinger's character development to speed up set Sansa's. Well, her character development is so... Well, what are they going to do for the next three seasons now? I don't know. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, jeez. How long till Sansa and Littlefinger are doing it? Oh, Give it an I episode. hope they got the George R. R. Martin okay on that one. Oh, don't you think that's coming in the books anyway, though? I think that there will be some sort of... Somebody will have drunk too much, mm -hmm. and something will happen. And I guarantee that nothing good will happen after that. No. But... No. All right, back to... Oh, well, let's finish off uh, in uh, the airy. So... 
we have Littlefinger then talking to good old Robin. Right. Everyone's favorite messed up child. You know, he reminds me so much of the, the little Lannister guy, what's his name? Tommen. Mm -hmm. He reminds, like, they're the same. Yeah. They're just being pulled along by the person who's pulling all the strings and it's just, no, this is a great thing for you to go out and ride a horse and learn how to kill a man. Like, this is exactly what you need to do. Your mother was And learn how to eat solid food. Let's not forget that one. Well, <laughs> Lord, who is going to ever get that scene out of their head? Certainly won't be I. Um, I just, I didn't think I realized it until this episode, how similar they are. That's a good, that, that's a really good poll. And it'll be interesting to see how they develop in similar and different ways from this point on, because they're pretty much separate kingdoms at this point. Yeah. I think everyone's come to terms that the Eerie is impregnable. Yep. As Braun put it in season... One. One. Yeah. Oh, jeez. And it just, it's never going to be penetrated, and that's going to be that way forever. And then you have King's Landing, where that's the actual, and so... It'll just be interesting to see where they take this from here. Yeah. And uh, the whole thing with uh, Robin and Tom is a really good commentary on the nature of power, too. In that, okay, these guys are technically the lords, and in Tom's case, the king. Um, they're the ones in charge, and they have no power whatsoever. You know, it's uh, Waymar Royce on one hand, and Littlefinger on the other hand, pulling the strings with Robin. You know, it's it, Tywin and Cersei with Tommen. <laughs> this is justice. I was having so much trouble lighting my pipe earlier. Now, I, now yeah. who's very I trouble? Have to put it after the video. That's true. I, I watched for the bonus scene of me just completely messing up, uh, right, lighting my pipes. We got the window open here. It's a window, windy day, so we're not entirely to blame. Just blame the elements, right? All right, but and then finally we have Sansa's evil outfit, uh, God, which is about as unsubtle like, as you can get. She looked like the Wicked Witch of the West in that thing. She was just like, I don't know, I was not, she's not there yet. I don't know. After one scene, she's yeah, not there yet. Exactly, it's too fast. Right. That really should be where she's at at the end of next season. You know. Yeah, I agree. So, her storyline. From here on out, her storyline is up in the air. Right, because I've pretty yeah. much gotten her to the point. She's at the point where we have read to. So exactly. If you are a show watcher, we will be reacting to Sansa in exactly the same way you are from here on out. All right, talk a little bit about Jorah while I let uh, Sam the dog out. Uh, Jorah has been found out. Oh, so this Jorah scene, I liked... That Barris is still being a man about it. It's just like, just let me know. I got this letter. I'm going to tell her anyways, but I wanted to let you know first. Yeah. Total man card. Total Barris. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just really just, yeah. Total wonderful guy there. Honest, just guy. Yeah. But then I got a little peeved because this scene... I didn't think it was going to happen. Did you think it was going to happen at some point? They had to get there eventually. So this scene happens before they even get to Marine. It yeah. happens on the way to Marine. It doesn't... Um, so we're actually back in book three material. Right. So we, we ended book three with Danny's storyline a few weeks ago. Then we had a scene or so of book five. And now we're back to a scene that was in book three. So, you know, we're just yeah. jumping back and forth. Uh, and so, with this scene, I was a little, I don't know. I would have rather it happened on the road there. I understand that they wanted Jorah to be there for the conquering of this and all that. So I get it. That's fine. I, right. Well, isn't he there for the conquering in the book? Like, doesn't she send him through the sewers or something like that? And then after he helps her conquer Marine, then he dismisses her? No, I thought they go through the sewers in Yunkai. Or is it Marine? He does go through the sewers. Yeah. I can't remember which city. It's one of those ones she comes I thought through. it was Yunkai. Because it was last season. 
That's and then true. went through the sewer. Yeah. I thought, I thought, though, that she was pissed at him when she sent him through the sewers. So. No, but I remember as soon as she found out, she dismissed him in a large argument right then and there. Yeah. I do it's wish that of... they had played up this season, the tension between Barristan and Jorah. Because uh, that's the whole thing. So in the books, Jorah knows who Barristan is. And he knows that Barristan probably has a good idea of what's been going on with him. Right. And so he's constantly trying to undermine Barristan with Danny and vice versa. And so it's this whole rivalry between these two. Well, isn't it in the books, now that I think about it, isn't it in the books that Barristan just comes out and says, you were spying, I was at the meeting when they talked about you spying because they were so mad at each other. I, th I think so. There wasn't, like there wasn't any letter of a pardon or anything, I don't think. It was purely like... This is... Yeah, and even here in this scene, they're so polite to each other. <laughs> it's like, no, they, these two need to be having a fist fight right, right they now. They need to be, like, going at it. Yeah. So that was unfortunate. All right, and then we get the uh, Arya and the Hound, who never actually make it all the way to the area in the books. So I'm not sure how, how far they're going to push this here. Uh, but they are at the area. And uh, Arya pretty much snaps. Uh, which was, I've heard some people criticize this scene, but I, I thought it was really good. I, I think it undermines that this is somebody who's been through a lot. Yeah. Uh, she's not snapping in the sense that, you know, she's on the edge of despair before she gets there. She's on the edge of complete cynicism and being borderline evil. Right. And this might be what pushes her over that edge. So I, I liked it. Yeah, I I liked it because every single person ever has felt that way. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we've actually laughed out loud at that point where it's just like, just fuck it. Like, nope, we're done. What do else not, can go wrong here? Yeah. yeah. Just do not care anymore. It's just like, well, there you go. Just sucks to suck. Like, exactly. It is, just, it is what it is, and what do you do? Yeah. And that's really at the point where she's at. She's just like, well, this is it. And so I think from here I can see where she goes and gets to her destination. Yes. I mean, I think you can see it too. Yes. They're I, definitely setting up they, what's going to happen. There. Yeah. I was surprised that they made it this far. As soon as I realized that, I was like, oh, they're already here. I was like, well, then what's going to... And so, it worked yeah, out the same. But assuming she gets to the her destination in the final episode, and assuming next week is all at the wall... I beg to differ. I think the final scene of that... I think the final ten minutes of next week is going to be someplace else. Maybe. Maybe. Do you think? Uh, I think they can do it. I, I think that the final episode, I think we're pretty much done with Sansa and Littlefinger. I think we're yeah. pretty much done after next week. We're done at the wall. Uh, maybe they'll throw a brand scene in there for about two minutes. Not even. Um, a minute and a half. Yeah. Might see, we'll probably see something else with Danny because if I'm not mistaken, every single season that ended with a Danny scene. Uh, I know the three and one have, and I'm blanking on what the final scene of season two was. Uh, so they very might very well end with a Danny scene again in, in season ten, but I think that if it's not a Danny scene, the final scene of the season will be the epilogue to book three, uh, which I don't want to even hint uh, at what that's going to be because it is it will it will blow it will blow your mind yeah mind. Obrid style no we're no <laughs> we're not there yet all right let's get there. Let's get there. So Tyrion and Jamie, another great conversation. Uh, what did you think of Cousin Orson and the Beatles? I love... Which there's a band name for you. Orson? Cousin Orson and the Beatles. Cousin Orson and the Beatles. God. Um, I loved this scene. Yeah. I did. And they didn't have an answer, and I was so looking forward to an answer. Like... Yeah. That I was just like, yeah, what's the answer going to be? And they didn't have one, and I was like... And that's the point. And that, yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Uh, I just... It is funny, because uh, I watched this episode last night with my wife, so I, I was able to kind of go online and read some of the reviews last night and today. 
and some people are complaining that that scene felt pointless. And like the conversation didn't go anywhere. And say, so, yeah, that's the point. It's a, it's a metaphor for killing and violence. Right. That. And it works on so many levels. I enjoyed it so much more having a day to think about it and then come back to it today. Is that, okay, Cousin Orson sitting there killing these beetles, killing these beetles, and he has his reasons, supposedly, but really there's no... It's just violence at the end of the day. And then Cousin Orson gets randomly kicked in the head by a mule and dies himself. Right. It's it, it's like it's a complete. It's one of those moments where they take uh, a monologue that perfectly encapsulates the message of this show, which is that people are violent, and you can't figure it out. Right. There isn't a reason. People are just evil. I would put this on par with the very slow finger. Oh, the ladder. The of chaos yes. is a, yeah. yeah. I would put Man. this on par with that. Yeah. Only because that's I, it. Just hits the ha- hammer, hammer and nail right there. Yeah, exactly, just... exactly. What a great scene! Uh, all right, and then the fight. Uh, oh man! So I've read Storm of Swords, which is the book that fight is in, yeah. four or five times. And now I've watched that scene twice. So I've got six, seven experiences of that scene. Every time, every time that scene hits me the same way, where it is so powerful. I love Oberyn's mantra of you raped her, you killed her, you murdered her children. Or you murdered her, you killed her children. And the way he goes at that. And then he gets to the mountain, he's down. It's like, just step away, just walk away, or thrust the spear into his face and end it. And of course he doesn't. It's so amazing. My name is Amigo (laughs) Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. That it, it truly just reminds me of that scene, except for, I don't know, well, it's obviously completely different, but... Um, it just, you're just like, just do it. Like, just finish him and be done. And then it's over and you can just rest easy knowing that he's dead. You don't, but I think that they do a great job. I, first of all, perfect to the books. Yep. The only difference is that he crushes his head instead of his chest. Yes. Either way, he dies. Um, I just, it just pulls you in, and you're just like, yes, make him say it. And then after you watch it, you're like, wait, you should have just kit like you should have just done it. Yep. And it's just such a perfect. It's not a metaphor. What would you call that? Just like a comparison to people's rage against others where you you want to hear them say it so bad that even though they're down you won't kill them until they say it exactly and it's, it's just exactly it's i mean we see that you see that all the time in real life mm-hmm. and you're just like oh i would have i would have killed him and you're like no i don't think you would have i think you want hopefully him. not with uh actual death at stake but yeah right but yeah. i mean it's just like no i wanted you to admit your guilt before you moved on, when really you should have just right. went in for the kill right away. I don't know. It, it is a perfect example of why George R. R. Martin is such a great writer. So let's think about all the things this scene does. Uh, you've character develop, development, both for Oberyn, uh, in terms of his real motives. Even though he dies, like we, we see him more authentically than we've ever seen him before. Right. For Tyrion with the desperation and everything, with Jamie and looking on. And, and so we have great character development. We have plot development in terms of what's going to happen with Tyrion. We have a great twist that, oh, Tyrion's going to be saved. No, nope, he's not. But then we also have this great commentary of what you were talking about uh, in terms of something that is a commentary on real life issues. And then also this commentary on power and violence and how Oberyn comes into that fight 
with a chance for justice, and he throws it away for revenge. Right. And that is exactly what makes Martin such a great writer, is that it's it's not only great storytelling, that it, it transcends into this level of a commentary on real-world stuff, of the thin line between revenge and justice, yeah. and how crossing that line destroys you. Yeah. It, it's so brilliant. Yeah. He just... Jeez. And then the, yeah, the head-crushing scene, where it's just like, okay, you got to hear it now, but you're going to die at the same time. The, the one question you want to ask over it was, was it worth it? Exactly. Was it worth it for you to die, but you got to hear those words? You wanted to hear him say it that badly. No, because what he wanted, I mean, what he ultimately wanted was the mountain to die for his crimes. Right. And, yeah, he but wants to hear he it. He twisted it in his mind so much that he wanted to hear it more than he wanted the mm -hmm. mountain to die. Exactly. exactly. And so he got exactly what he ultimately wanted. But I think he would change his mo. I mean, he became so corrupt due to his motives in the first place. Yeah. Now, regardless of whether or not I'm right about uh, next week, I don't think we're going to see Tyrion until episode 10. Okay. Uh, and more great stuff is coming. And that's all I'm going to say there. More great stuff is coming. Yes. If you have not read the books, uh, just buckle your seatbelt because you, the next couple weeks are going to be really, really There's good. one great Tyrion moment left. Yes. And honestly, I think assuming that's how it plays out, this will be the first season where episode 9 is not the great episode. Where episode 9 is going to be really good. But I, I think that honestly, episode 10 is going to be the one that blows people away even more. Is it because they got bored with it? Is no, it, it's... I, I, because we've talked about so much over the last season, especially season 3, how season, or it ended with the Red Wedding on episode 9, and then episode 10, we got to wrap up. Right. And just, like, relax for a minute. Yeah, so your episode and 9 so, like, so far, episode 9, Ned dies. He gets beheaded. Right. Episode 9, season 2, Blackwater. Episode 9, season 3, The Red Wedding. Episode 9, season 4, looks like it's going to be the Battle of the Wall, which will not disappoint. I think that's going to be a great episode, so don't hear me saying it's not. They saved the money from the dragons on this episode. Exactly. Exactly. All season, really, so that they could yeah. do this episode. Yeah, that's going to be Battle high the special wall. effects, high budget episode. It's going to be great. It's going to be exciting. But my favorite scenes from this book, not Storm of Stars, outside of you know, the Red Wedding and this scene today, uh, the best I, stuff comes in episode 10. You think so? Absolutely. The final scenes with Tyrion are just... Incredible. Just... Incredible. Yeah. And, and honestly, don't try and guess. You know, don't try and theorize. You might be able to figure it out. You might not. Just go along for the ride. Uh, because it's going to be that good. It really is. Yeah. All right. Two more weeks, everyone. Here we go. But uh, that's it for now. And uh, this is Sci-Fi Christian's... Game of Thrones Reviews, I'm Ben DiBono. I'm Ben Kirkwald. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. I still remember that one guy's comment. It was like... Yeah, I saw Ben play his match for the fifth time, and he was just like, fuck it, yeah. threw it down. It's just like, screw this, I'm done. We got wind coming in from the window for extra challenge today. Oh, all right. I was like, did I ever tell you about my time in Yellowstone trying to light a match? No, but I, we I were bet it was bad. We on the Roosevelt porch, Yeah. and like, it was like known, it was like, this is the place where Teddy Roosevelt would sit, like he built this cabin, would sit out here and smoke his pipe. And I was like, well, clearly this is the best place to smoke my pipe.
And so I tried, and I couldn't get a lat or a match lit. And this guy was like 50. He yeah. came over. He was so impressed that I was smoking a pipe. He was from like Texas. That's awesome. And he was like, you're smoking a pipe? Like, young people don't smoke pipes. And I was like, I smoke a pipe. And he's like, that's pretty awesome. And so I was like, yeah. And I tried to get my match lit. And he was like trying to tell me how to do it. And this is like, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And I was like, I'm... I'm You do burn yourself if you touch the metal part afterwards. I use my Zippo uh, when I'm out on the deck or whatever. Alright. Now this is just embarrassing. Mr. Matches don't work for me as this pipe go. And I'm on about my fifth match. You have to tilt it straight up in the air. No, the other way. Oh, I need to... Ah! Ah, you're not doing well. No, not tonight. Put this in the opening credits, would you? Make it a bonus. Episode. There you go. Now you got it. It's making an ad and scene at the end. Perfect. You're not gonna get it. This is match seven now. Shut up. Six. You are turning into me. What the hell happened? I'm gonna blame it on the window. I'm more. You want me to shut the window? No, no, no. It's fine. You sure it's fine? Doesn't look fine. Once you can get the wood to start, then you're good. Damn it! Alright. Clearly. I do like this English one, this is nice. Alright, I'm refilling this. We'll be getting momentarily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this shit. I'll be done with my first bowl by the time. I know! <laughs> By the way, on Wednesday you can bring your pipe if you want to. Oh, are we doing that in Ben's garage? Yeah. He's got a pretty nice space out there. Is, he, is it gonna be shut? He doesn't have like bugs in there, does he? Because if I'm getting eaten so. by mosquitoes, then, I'm not going. Hopefully it'll be shut. Might bring some bug spray just in case. I have a bottle in the back of my car at all times. Nice. Can't live in Minnesota and do that. No. Not do that. Do you know what I watched yesterday? Two what? days ago, Saturday night. What's that? Second Hobbit movie. Oh, uh, why? Had you seen it before? No, never. Okay, so. And so I was like, I know it's bad. I'm gonna watch it. And I watched it with really low expectations, and it didn't even meet those. It was just like. Isn't it terrible? It was just like wow. It was just. No, have you read The Hobbit, right? Mm -hmm. Who's uh, Bjorn, or the guy that, not the, okay, first of all, the bear guy, that was the stupidest thing they could have ever done with him. Yeah. And they could have, uh, no, uh, anyways, the guy from the Lake City, what was his name? Bor, I don't know, something with a B. Bard. Bard. That freaking looked like Orlando Bloom. Yeah. Guy. I was like, was not okay with that, I don't know. Bugged me. Yeah. The whole thing, and they didn't even, oh, it just, it just, it could have been so much better. We could have had like two or three conversations with the dragon. Like right. Like did in the book, and they could have been like intense, like they were with Gan, or with, um, with, um, what's his face in the caves? Gollum. With Gollum, yeah. 
Yeah. And it would have just been, it would have been amazing. But no, alas, we must keep it to five minutes because that's the attention span of somebody that chooses to watch it. And turn it into an action scene. Right. Like, can't we just... It's just disappointing, I guess. I expect it like that. I remember from the book was the coolest scene mm -hmm. in the book was him talking to the dragon. Yeah, I mean the barrel riding scene to me is the epitome of what went wrong oh in that my movie. God. <laughs> I was like, I remember Ben saying something about this barrel scene. So I was like, well, I'll play close attention oh, and see what I can. Shit! What the hell is happening today? You're not allowed to smoke today. Gosh! <laughs> Sam, you're going to start a fuck! What the hell was that? I don't know what he's in that. Yeah, let me show you how to do it. Yeah, I know how to fucking do it. Do you? Shut the damn window. We're going to oh, sweat. God damn it. See, you made me do it all the way over there. Put your hand on it. You got to be like a smoker on the sidewalk outside of work. Better if you lean back. <laughs>